Welcome back to Women of Hollywoodland, the podcast that explores the feminist dawn of Hollywood. We're on episode number five, and this week we're going to talk about perpetual ingenue, formidable businesswoman, and inventor of the baby spot. It's America's very first sweetheart, Mary Pickford. Firstly, though, thank you so much for tuning in again after a wee inadvertent hiatus. I'll be totally honest with you, this novel that I've been working on on and off for years suddenly came together in a kind of blinding flash of inspiration a couple of months ago and I dropped everything to write it. I'll have some news on its release in the next few weeks if you're interested. But now I have a glorious few weeks to dedicate to all things Hollywoodland. So you have six weeks of the Women of Hollywoodland podcast headed for you uh, to be followed a couple of weeks later by an entire season dropped in one day of a podcast exploring the Fatty Arbuckle scandal from a feminist perspective. I've just put a video up on uh, the Facebook page with a little bit more information on that. Just search for Hollywoodland the podcast on Facebook or you can find it via womenofhollywoodland.com. Right, last wee bit of housekeeping. This week's thank yous for sharing and reviewing. Paul D. London, Toby Hawken and Emma Dixcord. Thank you so much. And if you are enjoying this show and you'd like it to continue, the best way you can support it is to help spread the word. Share, tweet, blog, shout it out your car window, tell the person sitting next to you on the bus. If you want to hire a skywriter, I'm just saying it wouldn't be a bad thing. Anyway, on with this week's episode. So I have a bit of a dilemma about Mary Pickford, which I'm going to talk about, but I'll start by dispelling or at least semi-dispelling one of the main myths about her. Mary Pickford is one of those names that, along with Chaplin, I tend to find most people have kind of heard of, even if they don't know very much about the silent era. And generally, the impression they have of her is of this cutesy wee girl shrieking for help in the kind of overwrought melodramas often assumed to be typical of the period. Well, firstly, hopefully this series has already seen off the myth that silent films were all about overwrought melodramas. We know that Lois Weber was tackling social injustice while Mabel Normand was taking the piss out of hapless guys, all the while Universal was churning out high-octane westerns and thrillers. Secondly, the Mary Pickford character, now obviously she did play a variety of characters, but it's not unfair to say that she more or less kind of stuck to the Mary Pickford type. Yes, she was pretty and she was good in the conservative sense. Uh, She didn't overtly ruffle any Victorian ideals of femininity feathers, but she wasn't helpless. As eminent historian um, Kevin Brownlow puts it in The Parades Gone By, Whenever a situation got out of hand, she would not submit to self-pity. She would storm off and do something about it, often with hilariously disastrous results. And later he goes on, The ideal American girl is still the Mary Pickford character. Extremely attractive, warm-hearted, generous, funny, but independent and fiery-tempered when the occasion demands. Now, just to put the whole extremely attractive thing into context, this book was written in 1968. And Mary Pickford's characters were often literally independent. They tended to be orphans, and while she might be rewarded with a promise of romance towards the end, like in 1919's Daddy Longlegs, for example, she was rarely married on screen. And I find this particularly interesting because... One of the many problems that we have today with female characters is that they are invariably defined or given status from their relationship to a man. So look, for example, at the latest Bond film. There was this huge song and dance about how Spectre was going to feature feminist Bond girls and both characters were arguably steps in the right direction compared to your typical Bond girl, but they were respectively someone's wife and someone's daughter. Neither of these men even appear on screen, which makes it even more pointless that they're mentioned at all. Uh, They may say that no man is an island, but in Hollywood, uh, men are actually usually islands. Uh, Women, on the other hand, not so much. But Mary Pickford was. Molly Haskell in From Reverence to Rape, The Treatment of Women in the Movies, describes her on-screen image like this. Even at her most archangelic, 
Pickford was no American Cinderella or Snow White, whose only claim to consequence was a tiny foot or a pretty face. She was a rebel who, in the somewhat sentimental spirit of the prize puppy as underdog, championed the poor against the rich, scruffy orphans against the prissy rich kids. She was a little girl with gumption and self-reliance who could get herself out of trouble as easily as into it. And yet, for all that, Mary Pickford films didn't in any way challenge Victorian morality. She embodied a childlike, virginal, innocent ideal of womanhood that by the early 20s was already pretty old-fashioned. On screen, she was entirely non-threatening to the type of person who was easily spooked by the notion that women are autonomous beings. She didn't even bob her hair until 1929. And that's where we come to my dilemma. Okay, bear with me here, but I kind of call it the Paris Hilton dilemma. So do you remember 10 years ago or so when Paris Hilton was like the thing, uh, pre-Kardashians and all that? She was on that show with Nicole Richie and her persona was this baby-voiced, ditzy half-wit. Well, I came across an interview with her around that time and she was quoted as saying something like, do people not realise that that's just a character I put on for the show? I'm a businesswoman, a producer on the show, and I'm basically laughing all the way to the bank that people think I'm stupid. And I was like, huh. Is that some kind of feminist gotcha to take advantage of the negative way that society views women and turn it into cash? Or is it deeply frustrating and disappointing for a woman to perpetuate the stereotype of women as ditzy hatwits just because she individually is able to profit from it? I have to say I lean towards the latter and I kind of have the same reservation with Mary Pickford. But as I've already laid out, even on screen, her persona had a good bit more substance than Paris Hilton's. But even so, it very deliberately didn't challenge comfortable notions of femininity in the way that Mabel Norman doing pratfalls in a swimsuit did. Now, we talked about this more in her episode, but Mabel Norman suffered for it. It wasn't difficult for rumours about her being a drug fiend and involved in some vague way in shooting scandals to take hold, because she was somewhat subversive on screen. Mary Pickford, on the other hand, towed the line. It could be said, in fact, that she played the patriarchy's game and she won. So a little background. Mary Pickford was born Gladys Louise Smith in Toronto. Yes, America's sweetheart was in fact Canadian. In 1892 or 93 or 94, depending on which of her official studio bios you believe. She was the eldest of three, both Lottie and Jack Pickford followed their sister into acting, though neither of them reached her heights of success. Their father, John Smith, an alcoholic, died when Gladys was just five years old, leaving the family in dire poverty. Now, most bios I find are a little bit vague on exactly how Gladys started acting, but one of them, Pickford, the woman who made Hollywood by Eileen Whitfield, claims that her mother took in boarders to help it make ends meet, One of them was a stage manager and he suggested Gladys for a part at the Princess Theatre in Toronto. But what is pretty universally agreed upon is that by the age of eight, Gladys' acting career made her the family's breadwinner, a role that she maintained throughout her entire life. At 15, she took herself off to New York with her sights set on Broadway. After pestering producer David Belasco with letters and photographs, she was able to wire her mother... Gladys Smith, now Mary Pickford, engaged by David Belasco to appear on Broadway this fall. In an interview in the 60s, Mary told Kevin Brownlow, I went into pictures in 1909. Nobody ever directed me, not even Mr Griffith. I respected him, yes. I even had an affection for him. But when he told me to do things I didn't believe in, I wouldn't do them. And already her business acumen was in evidence. So, It was fairly standard in those days to pay actors $5 a day. Bear in mind there weren't any stars yet in 1909. Audiences wouldn't even know actors' names for another two years. But after just one day in Griffith's studio, Mary demanded and received $10 a day. And she earned it. In 1909, she appeared in 51 films at Griffith's Biograph Studio, later saying, I played scrub women and secretaries and women of all nationalities. I decided that if I could get into as many pictures as possible, I'd become known and there would be demand for my work. And she was quite right. By the end of the year, she was Biograph's preeminent star, known as the Girl with the Golden Curls. 
Now, the end of 1909, she went out to California, still with Biograph at that point, though the following year she starred in a few films for Carl Lemley's Independent Moving Pictures Company. You might remember from the Lois Weber episode that that was soon to become Universal. She returned briefly to Broadway in 1911 before Adolf Zucker bought her to Famous Players Lasky, which was soon to become Paramount, to star in a film called Tess of the Storm Country. Mary said about that, they thought that I was just another actress, but when I made Tess of the Storm Country, that was really the beginning of my career. The picture saved the company. Mr. Zucker told me later that he had taken his wife's necklace and his own insurance to pay salaries. Now, as her star power rose, Mary Pickford led the way in negotiating better and better deals for herself. She was the first actor to recognise her value to a production and she ensured that she was paid accordingly. So I think I've talked about this before, but because most films were short in those days, they tended to be sold in programmes of maybe three or four. And it quickly became practice to wrap a couple of riskier movies around a proven star vehicle. Her mother apparently overheard a couple of Paramount salesmen discussing the fact that as long as there was a Mary Pickford film on a given programme, they could sell anything. It was no coincidence that very soon after, Mary signed a new contract that doubled her previous salary to $2,000 a week, plus 50% of the profits from all her films, with a guarantee of $1,040,000. This made her the very first actor, female or male, to sign a contract worth a million dollars. For the next couple of years, it almost seemed as though she and Chaplin were on a mission to outdo one another in demanding more and more exorbitant salaries. Now, incidentally, there is a fairly enduring rumour that Pickford was a fairly, shall we say, formidable personality. But other than one instance of Mabel Normand apparently calling her a prissy bitch to a reporter, the only reports I can find of that aspect of her personality come from Chaplin, primarily in his autobiography. I can't help but wonder how much of his opinion of her was influenced by the fact that she was over 15, wouldn't sleep with him and earn more money than him. Either way, Mary won the war when her 1916 contract not only made her the highest paid star in Hollywood, but gave her the power to choose her own stories, director and cast. Mary Pickford, the producer, was here. Now, though Pickford never officially directed, as she took more and more control over her productions, her competence in every area became increasingly apparent. A cameraman who worked with her, a guy called Charles Rosher, said the director would just direct the crowd. She knew everything there was to know about motion pictures. For example, in 1917's Poor Little Rich Girl, she was playing a 10-year-old when she was in her late 20s. After noticing the way the light reflected off the mirror lying on her vanity and made her face look younger while she was getting ready in the morning, she asked director Maurice Turner to light her from below. The result was termed the baby spot, and it's still used today. Now, we can't have an episode of Mary Pickford without talking about Doug Fairbanks. They were both married to other people when they met while selling Liberty Bonds to raise money for the First World War. Now, as always with Hollywood legends, there's a dozen different versions of their first meeting, but my favourite is recounted in Carrie Beecham's Francis Marion biography, Without Lying Down. So Francis and Mary, and Mary's soon-to-be first husband, Owen Moore, went to a party where they met Doug Fairbanks and his soon-to-be first wife, Beth. Their friend, Elsie Janis, slightly knew the Fairbanks, and so she introduced them all, and it was decided that they would all go for a walk outside. During this walk, the group encountered a river, and the only way to get across was to balance along floating logs, a bit like the Roadrunner. Uh, Mary was wearing, apparently, a tight black velvet skirt, white satin blouse and white kid boots, but gamely tackled the logs. When she was about halfway across, she froze in panic and Doug appeared at her side to quite literally sweep her off her feet. Doug Fairbanks was, according to Anne Helen Peterson, the boy next door and the cowboy, the very embodiment of the American West with its conflicting suggestions of wildness and honour. He was the only male dramatic star to rival Pickford and they made this beautifully balanced couple where she was clever and ambitious, he was exuberant and happy-go-lucky. She was intellectual, he was athletic. She always knew what fart to use, he entertained party guests by swinging from the chandeliers. 
Mary's friends, Frances Marion and Anita Lewis, were a bit concerned by how quickly she fell for Doug and, of course, about the consequences of the impending scandal if news of their affair got out, but they were pleased to see Mary so happy. As Carrie Beecham puts it in Without Lying Down, Frances thought Owen, that was her first husband, put Mary down to build himself up, where Doug saw being with her as verification of his own worth. Ultimately, both Frances and Anita helped out keeping their affair under wraps. Frances wrote scripts for Mary, as we know, and Anita was Doug's screenwriter, so they would arrange to go riding, for example, with their respective writers and just so happened to run into each other. Of course, it eventually got out, and it's testament to both of their star power that they were able to negotiate leaving their respective spouses to marry one another with barely a whisper of scandal from even the Bible Belt. Owen Moore didn't help himself by saying things like, my wife has always seemed to me to be little more than a child to reporters, while it seems that Beth Fairbanks accepted a sizable alimony on the agreement that she would kind of fade into the background. Still though, it was impressive in a time when most of the media at least paid lip service to Victorian morality. Just two months after their marriage, Photoplay ran a story on when friendship turned to love and the narrative was sealed. Doug and Mary became the undisputed king and queen of Hollywood, entertaining almost nightly at their Beverly Hills mansion pick fair, which Life magazine described as a gathering place only slightly less important than the White House and much more fun. Though having said that, Marion Davies, mistress of newspaper magnate uh, William Randolph Hearst, and quite the party girl it has to be said, said in her autobiography, she did give good parties, a little bit on the dignified side, but otherwise all right. You couldn't take off your shoes and dance like you could at Lord Beaverbrook's house in London. Now, a few months before Mary and Doug married, they founded, along with Charlie Chaplin and D.W. Griffith, United Artists in 1919. While there had by then been a couple of production deals given to actors under the kind of banner of their studio, this was the first instance of creatives having total control over their own studio, prompting the famous quotation by Richard A. Rowland, an executive at the Metro Film Company, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. But Rowland was soon proved wrong. United Artists thrived and, as you no doubt know, is actually still alive and kicking today. In 1920, Pickford took advantage of the freedom that being her own producer gave her and announced that from then on, she would only make one picture a year in order to focus on quality. She and Frances Marion had been collaborating for years at this point and that year they made Pollyanna together, which grossed over a million dollars. She continued to churn out smash hits throughout most of the 20s, including a remake of Tess of the Storm Country in 1922, Rosita in 1923, Sparrows in 1926, and My Best Girl in 1927. Now, whether it was to do with the fact that, as I talked about earlier, she didn't ruffle patriarchal feathers, or it was simply that she was so powerful that she was untouchable, she was unscathed by this sort of decimation of women's careers that seemed to happen around 1922. Mary Pickford's undoing, in fact, and such as, as it was, she died in the 70s, still one of the richest women in America, was actually adulthood. Or perhaps more accurately, it was simply the nature of Hollywood. So while she definitely stretched her dramatic wings where she could, most notably in 1918 Stella Maris in collaboration with Frances Marion, she definitely played to type most often, and that type was We Girls. And I don't just mean ingenue types, like she played literal children much of the time. By the late 20s, she was in her late 30s and it was time for her to grow up. In 1929, she made headline news by bobbing her hair to play the lead role in her first talky coquette. In it, she plays a reckless socialite whose reputation is ruined when she spends a night alone in a cabin with a man, even though they just talk. Her father fatally shoots the man and later confesses that he has done wrong before killing himself. It's basically like if that Emma Stone movie Easy A went really, really dark. Pickford won the very first Academy Award for the role, but audiences failed to respond to her as a sophisticated pre-code gal. Now, yeah, she could form an argument that Hollywood doesn't allow women to grow up. That's certainly true. But I think in this case, it would be more accurate to say that Hollywood doesn't allow its stars to change. To me, that's kind of the difference between a movie star and an actor. And that's not to knock movie stars' acting ability per se. They deliver their types extremely well, but part of the deal you get with a movie star is that you know what to expect from them. 
Audiences were thrown by Pickford as a sophisticated adult woman, just as we might be thrown by going along to a Tom Cruise film and he's this vulnerable, sensitive guy who's scared of heights. I mean, every time George Clooney has tried to break out of that suave, wisecracking, handsome dude character, the movie bombs. So I don't know if we can fairly say that it was entirely sexism that didn't allow Mary Pickford to grow up. I left the screen because I didn't want what happened to Chaplin to happen to me, she told Kevin Brownlow in the late 60s. When he discarded the little tramp, the little tramp turned around and killed him. The little girl made me. I wasn't waiting for the little girl to kill me. Plus, of course, we were now in the world of the talkies. Mary Pickford once said that adding words to cinema was like putting lipstick on the Venus de Milo, and she was far from the only silent star to peace out at the advent of talkies. Though she didn't appear on screen again after 1933's Secrets, she stayed active in various industry roles for the rest of her life. She had been a founding member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and she stayed actively involved in it and was on the board of the United Artists until she finally sold her shares in the mid-50s. In 1932, she was instrumental in creating the Payroll Pledge Programme, which financed the relief fund for actors by deducting one half of 1% from the salaries of those making over $200 a week. And in 1941, she was one of the founders of the Society of Independent Motion Picture Producers. So we're back to the dilemma. Mary Pickford may well have perpetuated little girl notions of femininity on screen, but in contrast with Mabel Normand and Lois Weber, by doing so, she got to stick around and do a lot of good in a career spanning an entire lifetime. Was it a deal with the devil? I honestly don't know, but I'd love to hear what you think. There's a comment section on the episode page at womenofhollywoodland.com or you could drop me a line at claire at hollywoodlandseries.com or else come and chat in the Facebook group Hollywoodland Street Team. And as always, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join me next week to chat about Gentlemen Prefer Blonde's author Anita Luce. Thanks again. See you next week. (laughs) 